We've been going through Ezra and Nehemiah. Uh, we'll keep going through Ezra and Nehemiah until there's no more Ezra or Nehemiah to go through. Uh, this is our third week in the book of Ezra. Ezra is written by Ezra, hence the name Ezra. Also wrote Nehemiah. We're doing those two books together uh, because when you get back into the original, like, old scrolls, when you find them, they're always coupled together. So uh, we don't know if in antiquity they viewed them that way, but that's how they always are. Uh, it wasn't until later that they got split off into two separate books, and so we have decided to go through both of those uh, here at the church. We decided to do that because I think the message of Ezra resonates um, really well right now in the world that we are living in. I was just saying to my wife coming in, I was nervous to jump into this and preach it because it's so much Old Testament, but once you get through uh, the first week of the information dump, uh, it's not hard to preach because it's such uh, the same message when it comes to Jesus. So you have in the Bible then, like we talked about last week, you have this narrative that kind of rolls through Scripture about how man sins. When man sins, that sin drives them into uh, isolation. While they're in isolation, then they usually cry out for God of why am I in isolation? Then they have some sort of exodus where God calls them out of darkness. Uh, and then post exodus, you have restoration where they're restored back to what they were. And that tends to go into a cycle. And so Ezra and Nehemiah is again, a cycle of out of exile back into uh, restoration. So we pick up in Ezra where they have been in exile in Babylon. Uh, if any of that interests you and you want to catch up, you can find any of our messages online. Uh, you can find us on Facebook or on YouTube. Uh, you can look it up and catch up with old messages. So we did uh, last week then was about them coming back out of Babylon. So it's the first group who comes back. They come back out of Babylon. God, uh, through supernatural means, equips them by having the people who are around them uh, give them money, give them things. Uh, Cyrus has all of the old things needed from the temple. Uh, he gives that all back to them, and they come back to Babylon, or they come back to Israel out of Babylon. And when they get back, then it says that they uh, they come back in, they find their place, the, temp the tribe of Benjamin the, uh, and the tribe of Judah show back up. The priests then stay in the city with the people who are part of temple stuff. They all kind of live there back in uh, Jerusalem. Everybody else settles in the surrounding area, picks up farming uh, and that kind of jazz. And so that was last week, which brings us then to this week. And this week, we're going to look about, okay, so then what do they restore, right? So if the story is you come uh, out of sin, isolation, exodus, restoration, then once you hit the restoration, there's the now what, right? It's always like when you watch any type of movie where they overcome some insurmountable odds, and then the sun slowly fades as whoever the hero or heroine is standing out there looking at the sun, and you're like, well, now what? What do you do now? You overcome this great thing. You've come out of Babylon. You've done the impossible. You've gotten back. Well, now what do you do? Like, we're, we're here. What does this look like? And what is this thing that we're trying to restore? So you would think if you're going to show back up and you're going to uh, do, you know, you're going to restore the temple, that would be where they start, right? We're going to rebuild the temple first. We've got to have a temple before we can worship. But that isn't what they do. And what you'll see in the verses today is they don't restore the temple before they restore worship. And so today we're going to talk about worship. Now worship is a weird thing uh, inside of church if you're not churched. If you didn't grow up in church circles, if you didn't come through that, then when you show up for church, uh, worship can be awkward and weird. We used to do uh, the edge and you'd have all of these kids that would show up and 80% of the room didn't know Jesus. And it's, we just decided in the process of all that, let's just not do music at the beginning. Because if you have a whole room full of people who have no barometer for what church is supposed to be like, then they just draw their opinion on what they have come out of. And in the world, when you go see somebody play music, it isn't a one-on-one, -on -one, like, private, personal thing where we're supposed to be respectful and quiet, right? When we go see the rock band play, we talk to our friends, we maybe get something to drink, we cheer for the songs that we like, we talk over the band if it's too loud, we don't pay attention to what's going on, but when you're in worship, it's supposed to be different than that, and so we just decided with that, we ain't doing all of that, I ain't getting into all that. It's kind of why we don't do worship at the beginning here, because if we have people who show up who don't know Christ, I don't want their first to be experience to be, we sing worship songs for 25 minutes, and they have no... Uh, place of understanding of why they're doing it, right? We all have friends who don't know Christ who go, I don't want to go to church because when I show up, you guys just sing for an hour and I don't know any of the songs and I don't know what I'm supposed to be doing and it makes me feel awkward and weird when the lady screams and runs around in circles. Growing up, that made me always feel like I wasn't a good Christian. 
growing up, I always felt like coming up charismatic, coming up in that type of, of that type of world, the measure of your faith was directly related to how you acted during music in a worship service. It wasn't so much measured against like who you were or how you behaved, how you acted, your integrity, what you looked like in the world. Did you pray? Did you have a relationship with Jesus? No, it was just how do you act in a worship service? Do you cry? Are you a hand raiser? Are you not a hand raiser? Do you raise one hand, two hands? Do you put your hands together in the front? Are you pensive? These are all questions we have to ask ourselves. Do you talk out in the middle of service? Because that is a measure of that's your depth. If you're the one speaking, then obviously you have a direct relationship with God when somebody else doesn't. You have all these things in that way in your head. Do you want to run down to the altar every time the altar's open so everybody can see you? Run down to the altar. And every time there's an altar call, when it's time for you to get saved, you have to get saved every week because you want everybody to know that you're trying to work on your garbage. And if you're not getting saved every week, then do you really have a relationship with Jesus? If you don't have a relationship with Jesus, you're not worshiping right. And if you're not worshiping right, then you're not measuring up. And if you're not measuring up, you're not doing this right. And if you're not doing this right, then are you really a Christian at all? So I didn't really like worship growing up because I was always like, I don't know what to do with my hands. I don't know. Do we put them up? Do we put them down? And then if I don't put them up, like if I've come to the thing and I've been a part of this thing for a long time and I go through a year or two years, three years of youth and I'm sitting in youth group and then suddenly I'm like, I'm going to raise my hands and I'm going to worship. I'm going to, this feels like something I'm going to do. Then if I raise my hands, all my friends are like, why are you raising your hands, bro? You never raise your hands. What, what are you doing? Why are you acting like that? Why do you have your hands up? People can see you. Do they know what you're doing? So somewhere, though, in the midst of all of that, there is context for worship. So much so that it's supposed to define what makes us believers. We worship God. That's what we do. So when we look at Scripture and when we talk about faith and when we talk about this idea that it's sin into isolation, into exodus, into restoration, that restoration should be connotated by worship. And for it to be connotated by worship, we need to have a deep understanding of what worship is. And so they give us that in Scripture. You see that today, and we're going to look at it in this text. We're going to jump into chapter 3, verse 1. When the seventh month came, and the children of Israel were in the towns, the people gathered as one man to Jerusalem. So there's a whole lot going on in that text, and a whole lot we won't get because we're not Jewish. So I'm going to walk you through it so you understand. The seventh month uh, is important. That falls September, October, depending on a lunar calendar. The Jews are on a lunar calendar. We're on a solar calendar. Solar calendar is more accurate. Lunar calendar, not so much. That's why Easter moves. If you ever wondered why isn't Easter on the same, why isn't it the third Thursday of every November? Well, because it moves, uh, because the lunar calendar moves. So that's why, uh, that's why that happens. The same then true is the seventh month. The seventh month moves. Now, why is the seventh month important in a Jewish calendar because it starts the Feast of Trumpets. Now you go, this sounds fun. I like a good trumpet every now and then. So when you read about the Feast of Trumpets, the Feast of Trumpets had, uh, it had three different festivals that would start. So that September, October comes, it's the Feast of Trumpets. On the first day of that month, of the seventh month, we're going to have the Feast of Trumpets, which means we're going to get up in the morning and uh, somebody, Hezekiah, somebody's gonna, somebody with a, Jew, a real Jewish name, Malachi, somebody, they're going to go out there on the hill with their trumpet and they're going to blow the trumpet in Zion, right? We're going to blow the, it's the Feast of Trumpets. We're letting everybody know it's a new year. It's the beginning of the year. We're going to have a big feast to connotate it's the beginning of the year. It's harvest time. We're going to start over. Feast of Trumpets. Then day 10 is what they call the Day of Atonement, which is a big day in the Jewish calendar. So they would blow the trumpet on day one to let everybody know for 10 days we need to be preparing for the Day of Atonement. Now, the Day of Atonement, what would happen is the high priest would go into the temple, into the inner area, and he would sacrifice a lamb, and he would sprinkle blood on the mercy seat, which was the top of the Ark of the Covenant. He would sprinkle blood on that to absolve all sin that the Jewish nation had committed to separate themselves from God. It was a recentering back to, we are your people, you're our God, we are going to atone for our sin. Atonement is theologically super unique in all world religion to Christianity. There is no other religion that approaches atonement like Christians do. Because what we believe is Christ 
then if this thing is cyclical and this thing is repeating, then in our story of out of exile and into exodus and into restoration, in our story, Christ becomes the atonement. He becomes the sacrifice. It's by His blood we're saved. It's by His blood we're set free. It's by His blood we become who we're supposed to be. That all happens through Jesus. There is no other world religion out there where salvation comes on the hands or on the feet of someone else for you. All of it is built around you have to either absolve your own things you've done wrong, all of Islam, like they keep track, all it keeps track of everything you've done. When you get to heaven with him, he reads your list and goes, you have to spend X amount of days in hell before you're allowed to go into your heaven to atone for the thing you did wrong. You get into the Eastern stuff, we, don't, we just have to learn how to do away with our own desires, our own pleasure seeking. All of that needs to be gone away with so that we can cease to exist. It's very uplifting. That's their whole view. Christianity, though, is this idea that in spite of our weakness and in spite of the things we've done wrong, in spite of our sin, we serve a God who will love us and will forgive us if there's sacrifice made. Day of atonement, day 10, seventh month. The 15th day, then, of that month, is what they call the Feast of Booths or the Feast of Tabernacles. That was a celebration then of the original Exodus, the first time they get put into exile, right? They're in Egypt. God calls them out of Egypt. They wander in the wilderness. While they're in the wilderness, he gives them uh, specific instructions on how to build a tent for him to live in. It's called the tabernacle. And then that tabernacle exists within this community of tents where they would all wander around. And so when you'd have the Feast of Tabernacles, what they would do is they would all build tents in their front yards, and they would all go live in a tent to remember that God provided for them while they were in the wilderness. That while God called them out of Egypt, while God put them on an exodus, he had not fully given them Canaan yet. And in the midst of the wilderness, in the midst of the struggle of trying to find who they're supposed to be, God provided. So they would celebrate that. Now, every one of these feasts requires sacrifice. They have to be able to sacrifice for those things to happen. And those things happen on the seventh month. The Day of Atonement especially is very important here because if we miss it, we have to wait a year, right? We have to wait a year to absolve ourselves of the sin we have. Now, remember, they don't have just one year of sin they're trying to atone for. They got 70. They've been in exile in Babylon for 70 years. They've been in a place where they didn't know they were ever going to be able to worship again, ever be able to have a temple again, ever be able to be Jewish and do Jewish things. They've just been existing in exile. Is this ever going to get fixed? We don't know. So then when they show back up, what do they do? Verse 2, then arose Yeshua, the son of Josedat, looking for a kid's name, there you go, with his fellow priest, and Zerubbabel, another one. Please name your kid Zerubbabel, please. And then take pictures when he shows up to kindergarten. The son of Shealtiel with his kinsmen. They built the altar of the God of Israel to offer burnt offerings on, as it is written in the law of Moses, the man of God. So that altar they built, built is the burnt offering altar. Now, if you don't know uh, your Jewish architecture, here you go. That altar is not in the temple. It was set outside the temple, in front of it, as a way to atone for sin before you would enter into a holy place. These dorks show back up to rebuild the temple, and they don't even build the temple. The first thing they do is show back up and stack rocks up, so that they can atone, so that they can make sacrifice for sin, so that they can worship that way, so they can restore and repent. It's interesting to me that the thir first process when they show back up is not to immediately start rebuilding the temple. Well, why? Because the building doesn't matter. See, it's really funny to me whenever you go to study Ezra and Nehemiah and when you go to like listen to other people preach or look how other people have done things or you try to prep a sermon. If you, it's always built around this idea. You should use these two books to talk to people about building a new church building. You know, you do a big capital gain program. You have people show up. You put a big thermometer on the wall. You raise money every week. You stand up and you're like, we're in the Nehemiah. We're rebuilding the walls. Look at the money go up. We're getting this thing done. And listen, there's a place and a time for having a building. You got to have a building to do church in. But when these guys went back to restore their faith, when they went back 
to be what they were called to be, which was children of the king. They, they came back as Judah and Benjamin. They show up in the city as one man, Israel. They show up as Israel realized, Israel brought back. And when they show up to do that, what the first thing that they do? They restore the altar for atonement. You can't have a temple if you don't have an altar. Doesn't play well in the world we live in. Because we live in a world where we don't want to deal with problems. We want to self-actualize our problem. We want to take whatever that thing is that makes us weak, whatever that thing is that's a burden in our life, and instead of trying to say, even though I have the desire or the feeling to do this, even though I have the propensity or the proclivity to do this, I'm choosing to sacrifice that and become this. I'm choosing to not be that thing. This thing that I am, I don't want to be because he's making me a new thing. does not play well in the world we live in. You can't tell people how to look and how to act and how to live. Who do you think you are? They're not hurting you. Why would you think you have the right to tell somebody how they're supposed to look or how they're supposed to behave or how they're supposed to live? I mean, I hope you understand this morning, I'm not telling you anything. If you came in here thinking, man, Pastor Pat's got it all figured out and I'm going to do everything he says, you better check yourself because my life's just as much a mess as yours. You don't worship Pastor Pat. God help you. Christ is the one who speaks. I don't know who your perfect you is. I don't know the plans God has for you. You know who does? God. And for that plan to be realized, before we can do anything, you have to come to the altar. Before you can even go into the temple, you have to come to the altar and you have to offer sacrifice to atone, to set yourself right so that you can worship. You can't have a temple without an altar. So spending all the money and all the time and building something that looks pretty and doing all the work and getting the new chairs and putting down the new carpet and putting up the screams and playing the right music and making sure everything sounds how it's supposed to sound and having it all together means nothing if there's not an altar of restoration. Doesn't mean anything. It's just something that looks pretty. There's a lot of things in this world that architecturally look pretty that have no spiritual significance, right? Go to a ball stadium. Go to a new football stadium. Go to Dallas's football stadium with the world's largest TV. Oh. We don't even watch the game underneath it. We just watch it. We paid $800 to sit in here and watch the TV. There's no spiritual significance to that. Our churches should not be that. Well, they got great coffee in there, and they got the great donuts. They got 14 different keyboards, 19 guitar players, 22 drummers. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. 34 people singing at one time. Whew. What significant change has it made in your life? Well, none, but we love going. We love it. Makes us feel good. That's not what Christianity is supposed to be. You're somewhere in the track. You're either in sin, in isolation, in a process of exodus, or being restored. And when you're restored, what this text is showing us is restoration begins at an altar. And getting honest about what an altar is. You know who drives me the most crazy in the world? People who don't know who they really are. People that want to pretend like they're something that they're not. That's why I love youth ministry. Because kids don't do that, and hood kids especially don't do that. What you see is what you get. It makes my heart feel good when they come down for an altar call and they say to me that their life is effed up. Well, they can't say that at an altar. Well, why not? Listen, you don't have to have coarse language come out of your mouth, and as believers, we should strive to not talk like heathen. But when you're heathen, heathen talk like heathen. And we're better a spot for a heathen than at an altar. 
And at least they're being honest about who they are. But, man, you get into older people, you get into adults, and it's just all games. We just play games. Now you see me. Now you don't. Ooh, I love to dance a little sidestep. Now you see me. Now you don't. I've come and gone. Right? Nobody knows who I really am. Oh, look at him. He's got it so together. His family life is great. His wife's beautiful. His kids are wonderful. Everybody's making money and happy. His house is big. His car is new. Everything's going perfect for him. And if the truth of the heart of it, if you at home behind closed door, dead, dying, and decaying, sitting in your house trying to figure out who you really are, empty and lonely and afraid to let anybody see what's behind the veneer. But the truth of it is, it wasn't until the Jews went into exile in Babylon, until all hope was lost, until there was no way, any way that you could try to convey you were something you were weren't. We are just slaves and prisoners in a place that's not our own. We are stuck here. And unless God calls us out of this place, and unless God restores us, there's nothing we can do. That is who you are in isolation. I don't care how you define yourself in isolation. I don't care what the world says you are in isolation. The truth of the matter is, in isolation, that's what you are, hopeless. And when God calls you out of isolation, when he brings you out of Exodus and he brings you back, there should be a desire in you for restoration. He loved me in my broken state I need to know more about who he is. I need to know more about what he has for me. I need to know more about where he's leading me and where he's guiding me. And he goes, hey, you want to come into my house? You want to have a relationship with me? You got to get the ick off of you. Right? How many of you have those friends? You can come over. We'd love to have you for dinner, but we're a no-shoe house. You got to take your shoes off. You ain't taking my shoe. And you know me. I'm like, score. I don't wear them anyway. But. Right? But you know those people. Well, Jesus is the same way. Don't come into my temple. Don't come have a relationship with me. Don't come act like you love me and you care about me and you know who I am and what I have for you. Don't act like you believe everything I've taught and then bring a bunch of baggage in with you and pretend like it's not baggage. Listen, we're not talking about people this morning that are struggling in sin. We're talking about people who are trying to justify sin. There's a big difference. There's a big difference between like, I'm in a fist fight with sin in my life. And sometimes it beats me up, and sometimes I beat it up. Now, I know who God's called me to be, but this thing is a giant in my life, and I need prayer, and I need help to overcome it. Well, that's when you need an altar. That's when you need to get yourself back down there and restore. There's a big difference from that between like, this is my friend Jim, and he's a monster, but that's all right. You guys don't understand him like I do. Right? Like if I showed up at church with a pet grizzly bear. Hey, here's my pet grizzly bear. His name's Bart. He's cute. Is he safe? Oh, absolutely not. He's a grizzly bear. He ate his children before we came. Just ate him in the front yard. And then the whole time in the car, I was scared he was going to eat me, but he just chewed the seat to pieces. I brought him here so he would destroy one of you and not me. Why? Well, he's my friend. And he's always been around. Look how cute he is. But that's what we do with sin. Well, but Pastor Pat, you don't understand. Like, it's not easy. You don't understand. And sometimes sin feels good. and, And why would I have these? Why would God make me with these feelings if I'm not supposed to do them? He didn't make you with those feelings, dummy. That wasn't nice. He didn't make you with those feelings. He gave you free will. He didn't want you to be an automaton, a robot. He wanted you to be able to choose and to think. And if you can choose and think, then you have to be able to choose right, and you have to be able to choose wrong. If you can't choose wrong, then you can't choose. If you can't choose, you're a robot. Which means then you've got to be bright enough to recognize that there's choices that are right and there's choices that are wrong, and I have to figure out what those choices are and what a terrible sinner I am because I can't figure out. If there was only some way that I could come before someone who could restore my mind in a way that I could understand how to live and how to react, if there was some sort of thing I could come to and say, man, uh, God, I don't know where to go in this life. I don't know where to be led. I don't know how to live or how to react. And then when God sees you at his altar, 
and he restores you and he gives you his mind and you become a new thing and you look back on your life and you go, I was that and now I'm this, it should drive you to a place of worship. That's why you worship God. If you wonder in a worship service, why would I raise my hands? Why would I sing this song? Why does that lady get upset and cry? Why does that guy go down and lay down on the altar? Why does that guy act so weird during communion? Why does the person go out? Because they've all had experiences with Jesus. And it's in that moment, that intimate personal moment of worship that they recognize there is a God who loves them and created them and has purpose and design for them and they are interacting with that God and if you can't say that about your own life then you've never worshiped and if you've never worshiped then when you watch someone else do it it is weird you do go I don't know what this person's doing I don't understand why they're acting like that. I don't understand why they're making that choice or that decision. you got to come to the altar first. You got to come get restored and made right. Well, but Pastor Pat, um, what's everybody going to think of me if I do that? What are people going to do? People don't expect me to be the one who worships during service. They don't expect me to be the one to worship during my week. What if I'm driving my car and I'm praying and someone looks at me and thinks I'm talking to myself? Well, it's where where this text goes. Verse 3 says, They set the altar in its place, for fear was on them because of the people of the land. They offered burnt offering on it to the Lord, burnt offerings morning and evening. So they put the altar in place, and they just start sacrificing all the time. Now it says, they said it, uh, for fear was on them because of the people of the land. And you might go, that didn't make any sense. So you show back up, and there's people still there, right? Well, you know the ites are still around, the Amalekites, the Edomites, all those ites are still there, and they don't like the Jews. You have all that group. So they show back up, and they're afraid of them, so they're scared. So because they're scared then, they're big, intimidating. They're, okay, we got to, here we go. We're going to intimidate them. What are we going to do? We're going to stack some rocks up. We're going to kill baby lambs and burn them. That's what we're doing? Yes. That doesn't seem intimidating. It's not. So what's going on here? Listen, I challenge you with this this morning. This text does not mean that when they show up, there was fear because of the people of the land. What their fear was that they would not know who God was, and they wanted to make sure God was first because historically those people have felt the power and authority of Yahweh working through the Jewish people. So the fear then of the people of the land was that they would not be reconciled and restored at the altar enough that God would not honor them and protect them from the people around them. See, God does impossible things when we worship God. One time, my loving wife got a flat tire on her car. Now, men, if you don't know, when your wife gets a flat tire, that's your job. I don't say that in jest. It literally is your job. Number one, as a man, you're going to have to do it anyway. So you don't want her out there doing it because she's just going to screw it up. So get your stuff out there and take care of it. So she's got her little car out there. So I go out as the expert mechanic I am. No. And I get the jack out of her car. Now, her jack is this big. Her car is this big. Jack's a, it's this little bitty. And I'm always like, who did Satan design this? Do you call Satan and go, hey, we need a jack that is just too small to work? So I put this little baby jack under the front wheel of her car, and I jack the car up. I get the car up. Uh, now, my loving father taught me uh before you raise it you got to break the uh the lug nuts loose before you otherwise the wheel just spins okay so i break all the lug nuts loose i'm doing it right i got the car up on the scissor jack i know what i'm doing i go to get the tire off and the tire will not come off so i post on facebook how do i get a flat tire that's stuck on the wheel off the wheel so everybody has advice none of the advice works so the last advice that someone gives me is to put a put the like 
screwy thing. I don't know what that's called. <laughs> You're welcome. Put that through the wheel and lean on it, and it'll break loose. So I get it on there, and I'm leaning on it. When I lean on it, the whole car falls off the jack. And I'm like, what do you do now? This is insurmountable. This is impossible. So I'm just like, I don't know, you're just mad, right? Because women, this is the point women would cry. This point is men that you're like looking for inanimate objects to wing places. Oh, look, there goes all his tools into the front yard. And he's blessing them as he throws them. That's weird. But if you're an addict, if your relationship's broken, if you're chasing money and greed for happiness, if you've set these things up in your life as these are the things you're supposed to be happy, and now I'm telling you that God has a bigger plan for your life and all of these things that you think are important are not important, it can feel like that car sitting on the pavement. Listen, you can tell me all day long what I'm supposed to do, but I, I can't do that. Like this thing that is defining me defines me. Right? I can declare all day long I'm a ballerina, but I'm not. So you go and, hey, God's got a plan, and you don't have to be addicted to this. You don't have to be addicted to that. God will fix your broken marriage. God will fix your broken relationships. God will give you a new thing to pursue. God will make you happy. All that stuff is contingent on what? God. So what I do in my car? I called a buddy. Now, I have a buddy who's built like a cedar tree. He's a gorilla. Great big dude. Called him, and I go, Bryson. I made a mess over here, and I got my car sitting on the pavement. And he goes, I'll come help you. Okay. I don't know what you're going to do. You can come look how bad I screwed it up. So big boy gets in his car, and over he comes. Now, big boy, let me tell you. So you get, I don't want you to miss how big this individual is. When we went and got fitted for chess, for weddings, right, you go get fitted. My buddy got married. We all had to get fitted for tuxes. They measured my chest, and it was 56 inches. And I'm like, that's right. Don't you forget it. Because we had some, some little dudes with us, little wiener dudes that are like, 42. I'm like, ha-ha, fifth grade. Now, they measured Bryson's chest 67 inches. Yeah. Enormous. So he gets there. He shows up. He doesn't even miss a beat. He goes, well, I'll just pick it up, and you put the jack back underneath it. And I go, you'll pick what up? <laughs> the car. You're going to pick the car up? Yeah. It's a four-cylinder. Oh, okay. Sure. So he goes, well, just pick it up, and we'll put the jack underneath of it, and then we'll put the tire back on it, and we'll get it fixed. And I go, Bryson, you do realize that a normal approach to the situation is not we're just going to pick the car up. And he's like, just shut up. I'll pick the car up. So this monster, gets in the front of my wife's car, bends down, puts both forklift arms underneath of it, and just stands up with the whole car. And then looks at me and goes, put the jack under. He's not even breathing heavy. His head's not red. He's not sweating. He's just standing there holding the front end of a vehicle. Go on. So I'm like, okay. Put my little, we're good. Man, all I had to do was just pick up the little bitty, boop, there we are. That's how God views your mess. I'm addicted to this. I'm addicted to that. I can't stop doing this. You don't understand how hard it is. And God's like, whoop, just put the thing back under there and we'll go from there. Look, restoration is just coming to an altar. Just get there. Well, but, Jesus, you don't understand how, I don't care, I don't care what baggage you're dragging to the altar, get it to the altar. Push it, kick it, slap it, whatever you got to do, get it to the altar. Because until it's consumed, until it's burned up, until it's reduced to nothing, I can't fix what's wrong. And you can either pretend like you got it all figured out or you can actually step into what Christ has for you. we got a lot of people in this world that just want to vacillate around holding bags of rocks trying to figure out why they're drowning in the deep end when you got a God of love and hope and redemption saying to you, you can put the rocks down. 
I'll take the rocks. I've already paid the price for the rocks. I've already ransomed you. I've already bought you. I've already overcome this thing you think you can't overcome. Now listen, if God did that, if God said, I've overcome sin, if God conquered that, why would the enemy not convince you, no, he hasn't? I've restored you and I've made you new. Mm -mm, no, he hasn't. Why are you listening to him? Why are you listening to what that thing's telling you? Why are you listening to yourself? You already know you're a liar. You already know you're going to mislead yourself. You already know that you have the propensity to do things you don't want to be doing. You already know that these things you're pursuing are not making you happy. You already know that this thing makes you feel hopeless, makes you feel separated. You already know that you still are having now what moments with these things that when you get your hands on them, they're not making you feel any more self-fulfilled or realized. Yet when the enemy goes, well, now listen, how are you going to survive if you don't do that? We entertain it. We want to listen to it and go, oh, yeah, you're probably, yeah, it's tough. Listen, until we restore the altar, God can't build the temple. We know that from Scripture here. Verse 4, and they kept the Feast of Booth as it's written and offered the daily burnt offerings by number according to the rule as each day required. After at that, the regular burnt offerings and the offerings at the new moon and all the appointed feasts of the Lord and the offerings of everyone who made a freewill offering to the Lord. From the first day of the seventh month, they begin to offer burnt offerings to the Lord, but the foundation of the temple was not yet laid. So they gave money to the masons and the carpenters, food and drink and oil to the Sidonians and the Tyrrhenians to bring cedar trees from Lebanon to the sea to Joppa, according to the grant that they had from Cyrus, king of Persia. Once they light the fires of restoration on the mountain of Zion, once they restore the altar, it was only then that they begin to seek the things to build the temple. Now, New Testament theology. Here's what the temple is. You. There's this moment where Jesus interacts with a Samaritan woman and she's trying to figure out which temple we're supposed to worship in. So you got the temple they're going to rebuild in Ezra and Nehemiah. And you also have a Samaritan temple that's up in the north. And when Jesus talks to her, she's like, well, which temple's right? Who, where are we supposed to be? And you know what Jesus says? There's coming a day when you won't worship in a temple, but you'll worship in spirit and in truth. Paul writes, do you not know that your body is the temple of God? So to restore the temple in the Old Testament, you need an altar. There is nothing to say that that should not also be true for the new. You want to restore the temple of God? You want to put power and authority back into the hands of those who follow after him? You want to see God move and great things happen? You want to see power and authority rest upon your shoulders? You want to have experiences and worship services where you feel God? Then repent. Come to an altar. <coughs> Come to an altar and get it right. And I know it feels weird. I know it's not what we talk about in this world. I know that we don't like this idea. But there are things that even though we can do them, we shouldn't be doing them. And if we can lay them down, then God is free to work through your life and make you, in you, want, make him, make you into what He wants you to be. Altars at churches should be full all the time. Pastor Pat, this was starting to feel like at the beginning when you were talking about you didn't, do we put our hands together, do we raise our hands, do we lower? Where is the altar? Well, that's the closing of this message. Where is the altar? It's not in the temple, it's in front of it. So what's in front of God's temple? Well, you tell me because you're it. You get to take that altar with you wherever you go because the temple moves. So the temple, this isn't the altar? It can be an altar. You can come down here and make an altar down here. That's fine with me. If you need to have some symbolic experience where you come down and this becomes your altar, that's fine. But don't think that when you walk outside these doors, you get to leave that altar here. Like, whew, I dodged that bullet. I don't have to think about that anymore. Uh-uh. You walk outside these doors, you're still the temple of the living, breathing God. And guess what follows you? His altar. 
That altar follows you wherever you go, whatever you do. When you're in your dark moments, when you're sinning, when you're doing things you shouldn't need to do, that altar just sits there right in front of you. It's just waiting for you to make a sacrifice. It's just waiting for you to say, okay, I've done it enough. I've had enough. Lord, make me a new thing. And whenever you say that, whenever you repent, you light the fire on that altar again for Jesus Christ in your life, and you become a new thing. You don't need a building. You don't need me. You don't need people around you. You need to have an experience with the God who created Created you, and that experience can happen at any moment. That experience happens when you recognize that while you're still a sinner, Christ died for you. He didn't leave you into isolation. He called you out of darkness, and the exodus awaits if you will just take that which is leading you into darkness, put it on the altar in front of you, set it on fire, and become a new thing. Sacrifice it. Take that thing and let go of it. It is not doing anything for you but causing death and decay. They were worried about those around them because they knew that if they didn't put God first, sin would destroy them. We have to wake up and we have to repent. So before we rebuild a temple, before we make the focus on how everything looks and what's pretty and what shows our love and admiration for God, what shows the beauty that He encapsulates, before we do any of that, we have to focus on ourself, the collective that is the temple, which means you've got to get the dirt and the muck out, which means you've got to build an altar. So today, as we go into worship, that's what we're going to do. That's why we take communion. Communion is the time that we remember Christ atoned for our sin. That's why you do it. The bread's his body. The grape juice is his blood. He was broken and poured out and given as a sacrifice to account for all sin for human beings so that we can step back into a relationship with God. So for some of you this morning, when you take communion today, that can be your altar moment. That can be the moment that before you take that communion, you just say a little prayer. Man, Lord, I've been chasing after the wrong things. I've been in Babylon, and I'm ready for restoration. And I ain't listening to the voices in my head no more. I ain't listening to what this world says. All I'm listening to is you and what you have for me. And I want to know you. I want to have an experience with you. Which brings me to the next thing. Some of you need to get into it when it comes to worship. Now, I'm not talking about you running around in circles in here and putting your hands in the air and acting how spiritual you are. If that's your jam, that's fine, but that's not the measure of having a worship experience. A worship experience needs to be going on every day, every second, every minute. When does it say they do sacrifices? In the morning, in the evening, in the afternoon, in the summertime, in the wintertime? All the time. They're always sacrificing. Well, why? Because God is at the forefront of who they are. You think you're going to just go to that altar one time and repent, and that's going to be the end of it? You better wake up, child. You're going to be sinning all the time. You're going to be falling short all the time. That's why the altar goes with you. That's why the altar's not at some spot. How annoying would it be that every time you sinned, you had to show up here? Where's Dad? He's down at the church again. He was working on the car. He's going to be there a while. No, God's like, we got to fix this. They need to take that altar with them. We need to have a portable altar. You need to be able to repent all the time because you're going to fall short all the time. And then you need to not be content with God not showing up. If you pray and you're asking to experience God and you're not experiencing God, then that does not mean that you give up and go, I guess I'm not spiritual. What that means is you go deeper. You go after it harder. You figure out how it's going to work for you. Man, if you've got something you love and you care about, you don't just try once. You just keep trying to figure it out. Husbands, when you met your wife for the first time, you did every possible thing you could to turn her eye your way. You weren't like, well, I told her and she didn't care, so I'm just moving on. Whatever. Anyway, you did. It's not how it works. You quit talking to your friends. You started taking showers, wearing right clothes. You were cleaning your house. You were doing everything you could to draw her eye your way. Why would you not do the same for the God who created you who's trying to restore you to a new thing? Well, I prayed once and nothing happened. What? Keep praying. 
And don't forget, there's an enemy in this world that doesn't want you to have those experiences. <laughs> that's going to put things in the way of that experience happening. There is a spiritual battle that goes on in the otherworldly realm here for your soul. Hell does not want you to experience heaven. But before you restore the temple, you restore the altar. you got to clear the path, and then you go after God until God shows up. Because what matters is that relationship with the eternal. Everything else is not eternal. Only God is. So this morning... Be restored. As we go into worship, find an altar. Find some spot in this room to get it right. Ask God to reveal to you the things that are keeping him from you. Ask God to reveal to you the things that you are worshiping over him. And then let's be a church that is consumed with experiencing God, not just in a corporate setting, but in a daily setting. In our daily lives, God speaks to the people at Vintage Church because we have walked ourselves to an altar and we have allowed Him to restore who we are so that we can experience who He is. You can't build the temple until you restore the altar. Let's pray. Lord, I come to you this morning. I lift up every person in this room that right now the enemy is speaking garbage into their head. That right now is worried about what are people going to think? What are people going to do? This is weird. I feel awkward. Lord, we just come against that message in this room right now. Lord, we want to stoke the fires at your altar. We want to get it good and hot so it can consume the things that are in our lives that we feel like we can't overcome. God, we look at it like we can't pick the front end of a car up and you look at it and think this isn't even a job. God, we know you are a God of restoration. And so while the enemy doesn't want the people in this room to know that, Lord, we pray you would come in like a flood and reveal it to them. Lord, take sins from people this morning. Take sins away from people. Take the desire, the proclivity, the want for the things that are leading to our demise. Lord, take that thing from us. What once was hopeful, what once was happy, Lord, I pray would make us sick to our stomachs as we have a recognition of who you are and what it is that you have for us. Set us free from the darkness that plagues our life. Lord, let us burn with a light that the world sees. Let this be a place with an altar that never goes out, an altar that never ceases. Lord, help us take that altar with us as we go about our lives. When we mess up, Lord, don't let us go to sleep. Don't let us walk away from that moment. But in that moment, make it a recognition moment of I need to come back to the altar of Jesus Christ and I need to be restored again. You have not left us. You have not forsaken forsake us. You have not condemned us into darkness, but you have paid a price and ransomed us out of hell, called us out of isolation, exited us out of a kingdom that doesn't care about us, and set us on a path to where we can become one with the eternal and we can know you. And so, Lord, for those of us in this room that have never experienced your power, never experienced your authority, we've never heard your small voice speak into our mind, we've never been led by you, never been guided by you, we haven't felt your hand upon our life, we haven't felt your spirit move through us, Lord, I pray this morning for every person in this room that would have a desire and a want to know you, that, God, you would be evident and real in their life, that you would reveal yourself, your power, and your authority to them. Give them a boldness and a passion and an understanding for the power of an altar that burns, Lord, and then build this temple in a way that we add people to it weekly, that you call people out of darkness to come to the foot of your cross, that Calvary will still continue to overcome the sins of this world, even when it seems hopeless, even when it seems overwhelming, that, God, you are the God in the midst of the storm. Lord, I again pray against the enemy in this room, against that voice in our heads that tells us things that aren't true. Lord, I pray that you would scream out over the top of that lie. There is hope at your altar. There is peace at your altar. There is freedom at your altar. And we are wayward sons and daughters. 
Lord, I pray that you would call us home, call us out of sin, call us out of darkness, and restore us back to what it is you want us to be. Lord, we thank you for the message of the Bible. We thank you from sin, isolation, exodus, restoration. We thank you that you saw fit to love us in spite of our brokenness. We thank you for the atonement of the cross. And now, Lord, I plead that over every person in this room. Lord, be a God that dwells at your altar. It's in your gracious name we pray. Amen.